Okay, so the most common form of the equation of a line is in what form? What's that form called? Slope intercept. We got the slope and the y intercept. How long do we need to be standing? Put in several pockets, right? Y'all just have a hundred pockets and you just had to reassemble it? Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. There's a big problem to have. Um, so if we have the slope and we have the y-intercept, then we can complete this equation. Right? So number eight here should be a particularly easy problem to do, right? Because we have the slope and we have the y-intercept. We just plug those things in and we get y equals negative five x minus one. Done. Um, I remember I may have said it a few times, or I may have just said it briefly. If we have enough information to graph the line, if you could imagine graphing this line with the information they give you, you have enough to write the equation of the line. And so they give us a point, and they tell us that the line that goes through this point is perpendicular to this other line. Okay. Um, so they give us the point. And then what is this telling us about our line that we're trying to write the equation for? Slope. Oops. Right? Per perpendicular is a comment about comparing the slopes of two lines. So what's the slope of this line? Four lines. This is equal to four. What's the or color coded? This blue one. So what does that mean the slope is of the line that goes through that point? Negative one, one, four. Yeah, negative one fourth for that blue one. So we've got a point and we have a slope. Now it's not as easy as this guy right here, but uh, it's doable. How are we going to? We could we could write y equals negative one fourth x plus b, but that's not enough. We need b. How do we find b? Plug the point in. Who said that? Who said that? Uh, all right, so we plug the point in. We have an x and we have a y. x is 3 and y is negative 1. So negative 1 equals negative 3 fourths plus b. And b equals, what's b equal? 1 fourth. 1 fourth? 1 fourth? Negative, negative 1 fourth. OK, so we have b and we have m. So y equals mx plus b, which is a negative one fourth. Okay. Now they give us uh, two points. We got a point and another point. We. What else do we need to complete this equation? Slope. Slope. Can we find the slope of two points? Yeah. How so? Am I just doing it? What's that? I said, am I just doing it? Or? I guess, because nobody else is stepping up. You can graph it and find the rise of the run. You certainly could do that. You could graph those two points and you could count it off. Yeah? What else could you do if you wanted to be more numerical? Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Right. So we'll call this one uh, the second point and this one the first point. So our Y2 minus Y1. Over negative three minus negative five. Okay, so uh, eight plus two is ten. Over negative three plus five is two, and we get a slope of five. So now we have a slope of five, and uh, now what? Find the y-intercept. Find the y-intercept by doing what? Same thing as this problem right here. Yeah. Plug in the point, and we plugged in uh, the slope, and we solved for b. So y is 8 m x plus b. So b is equal to, this is negative 15, so plus 8. So. <coughs> Let's see, we'll, we'll check it. Y equals uh, m x 
plus b. <coughs> um, okay, so now all that was 2.3 now, or 2.2, 2. what was that? Four. 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 Hey, it's right up there. 2.4 now, we're into 2.5 direct variation. Direct variation, let's say, uh, if y and x vary, uh, that's the word vary, directly. Then what are we saying? What is the what does that mean? One point will always be zero now, or it will always go through the origin. That's true of the the line that, that you graph. So that means the y-intercept is what? Zero. Zero. So the equation looks like the equation of a line without any well plus zero, right? Yeah. With a plus zero. So uh, and for some reason we don't use m anymore in direct radius. We use a. It's just a choice of the text in most processors. So if you can write an equation like this with a number a times x, any number a times x, uh, it's direct variation. So we come over here and we ask ourselves, is this direct variation? Yes. How do you know? Because there's not a numerical value for the constant. Or, well, there, other than zero. There's a, there's a, a value for, for the constant of zero. So it's linear. You might recognize this as the standard form of a linear equation. And uh, there's the constant is zero. There's no other constant other than the zero. So that's kind of a way to look at it for sure. Um, could we try and write it like this? Mm -hmm. Right? Get y by itself. Right? Get y by itself. Can we get y by itself? How do we get y by itself? Plus five. Plus five x two y equals five x. Five by two. Five by two, y equals five halves x. Yeah. Okay. And now in the last problem we ask ourselves, uh, is this direct variation? Okay. Which means can we create an equation that goes from x to y this way? And if so, then what would a be? Can we multiply x by a number and get y? We could start here, we could definitely, we could always do that. If we have two numbers, we should always be able to multiply one by some other number, whether it be a fraction or decimal or something, and get the other number, right? So what do you multiply three by to get negative one? Negative one over three. one over three, does that work for this guy? Yeah. This one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. And this one? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the equation? Y equals? Negative one over three times x. That's it. We good? Any questions from the quiz? Any questions from the homework? That must be really good. Yeah. If you guys don't have any questions ever. Okay, let's pass it in. These are all geniuses. No, you can't take credit for it, sorry. It's all mind doing. Unless you don't do well, then it's all your fault. <laughs> What's a, what's a function? I'm going to ask you that. We've already talked about this before. We defined a function. So what is a function? It is a way of comparing one number to another number in a rational format. Hmm. We're getting there. there it is, it's not really a comparison of numbers, but it is a relationship between two numbers. One number gets related to another number, usually by some kind of a rule, like take one number, multiply it by two. 
What do we call that number that we that goes into the function? Input. Input. Goes in. It's input. You put it in. It's input. So x would be input and y would be output. Well, you could make any letters represent input and output, but typically, yeah, x and y are that way. X is input, y is output. Okay. So a function has input and output, and is that enough to be a function? Mm. What's that other? <coughs> Constant. Input has to change. Um, we can change the input if we want to. We're using the function. We're, we're the users of the function. We can put in whatever we want, this, as long as it's in the domain of that function. What's that other special thing about a function? I say, is this a function? You ask yourself, is this true about this, this thing? Can only have one output? Can only have one output for every input. Every input has one and only one output. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember I said this a while ago, I'll keep saying it, is this idea of input and output that's so crucial uh, to understanding about functions. Stuff goes in and stuff comes out. This thing, this thing is <laughs> really get rid of that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna never get rid of that. Just put it on top of that. Forget it. Anyway. Um, so this idea of input, output, input, output. If you can remember that, a lot of confusion can be done away with. Okay? It's not magic stuff. It's not hard to understand. This stuff goes into a function and stuff comes out. Okay, so I'm gonna put a function up here. Um, and well, well first I'll write it and I'll let you look at it. What what is that function? Y what? Y equals absolute value. The absolute value of x, yeah. Okay. Um I would like you to, in your notes, with your pencils, get ready. You have them in your hands, maybe your left hand, your left hand. Okay. And use your brain, just your brain, okay, right now. And what you know about absolute values. Don't look at your books, okay? That's just trying to shortcut your way through the answer. But if you if you make your brains do the work, it'll be good for you. Alright? Right there. But from from wherever you want to wherever you want, but let's keep it near the origin. I'd like you to graph the absolute value of x. Y equals the absolute value of x. Okay, I'll give you a, a little bit to, to start that out. And if you're stumped as where to start, then uh, then I'll come back around and see if we can't get farther. Further. Function. But I, the point I just made, remember, is about input and output. If you want to know about a function and what what this function is like and how it acts, start looking at its input and its output. That's what we care about in a function. So, if you want to graph it, you have your we can call this the input axis. This is where the inputs are, and this would be the output axis. We look along this axis to find input. And then we go up in the direction of the output axis to graph the output. And if you don't know what this function is supposed to look like when you graph it, then what should you do? Think about it. Thinking about it is a good idea. Rather vague. What do we do if we don't know what a function looks like when we get an idea of what the graph looks like? x equals zero? Yeah, x equals zero. And then, okay, so x is zero, so now what? Find what y is. Find what y is, right? And should you do that some more? No. And then do it again. Then do it again and do it again for different inputs. Okay. That's what we're saying. The function 
A function is input and output. That's what a function is for. So if we start looking at the input and output of the function, we start to get an idea of how the function behaves. Just try that. Just try putting some input in and seeing what the output looks like. See if it starts to take shape. So what's what's an input that someone put into this function? Yep. Negative five. Negative five. Okay. So one way we can show this input output relationship is we'll put inputs here and outputs there, and an input of negative five gives us an output of five. Five, right? Because what's the absolute value mean? Constant. Okay. We got another volunteer. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's just how much energy Okay. Positive value, the, the, the distance away from zero. Right, that's the one we come back to that puts it very um, uh, specific, makes it very spe specific definition. The, de the distance from uh, zero, the negative five is, is five. So in goes negative five and out comes positive five. So one, two, three, four, five on the input axis, on the output axis, one, two, three, four, and five. And we put a point right there. That's another input we can use. Gordon already gave us an input. What's another input that we can give us? Three. Three, how about three? Okay, put three into the function, what comes out? Absolute value of three is? Three. Three is three away from zero. So, one, two, three. One, two, three. There we go. Um, let's put in maybe negative two. What's the output for this function for negative two? Two. two. So what does this function seem to do? What's the behavior of this function? When you put something in, like what, what does it tend to do with that number? What does it give you out? You put a number in, and what kind of number do you get out? Is it always positive? Yeah, if we, even if you put a negative number in there, It'll be positive. The only counterexample to that would be zero. Right? You put in zero, you get out zero, which isn't positive or negative. It's just zero. It's mystical. It's, um, it's a bit mystical. So if we put in one, we get out one. We put in two, we get out two. Put in negative one, we get out negative one. Negative three gives us positive three. Um, oh, that was four. Oh, that should have been up there. And this should be right here. And I should erase that. So what shape does it look like this would be if we connected all the points that we could ever draw? <coughs> yeah? Parabola? Not a parabola. Parabola is more curvy. Like that. Does it seem like it's going to be very curvy? No. Yeah. It's going to be two straight lines. Two straight lines meeting. Oh, I'm going to erase all those points. Meaning? Oh. Two rays. Uh, two rays, meaning a zero, sure. These go on forever in those directions. Okay. Let's think about this. This is function y equals x, right? Not the absolute value of x, but just y equals x. Well, in this function, if you put in one, you get out one. Put in three, you put, get out three. But if you put in negative two, you get out negative two. So this function does a lot the same thing as the absolute value, but it just keeps going into the negative. 
So this absolute value is almost like it was coming down towards here and it just bounced off and kept going positive. But like it has the same slope, right? Over there, kind of like the opposite slope. Okay. Well, yeah, because it's like perpendicular, right? Uh, it will be. It won't be perpendicular, but it will be like it's bouncing off a mirror, right? It'll have like. It'll well, yeah, it's like not just, like perpendicular. Yeah. Yeah, kind of perpendicular. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, so this absolute value thing, it's, it's like the lines we've already been drawing and graphing, but once, they, once the line would try and go negative, the absolute value wouldn't, and it would just kind of come back up off at the same angle. Okay, so that's an observation we can make. Well, there we go. Y equals the absolute value of x. We've done it. We've graphed it. it looks like that. Okay. Um, all throughout this year, we're going to be learning about a different function. New, I'll introduce a new kind of function. We'll look at the way it behaves. We'll work on its graph. And then at its most basic graph. This is the most basic graph. It's called the, the parent function. Right? The absolute value of x. It's as simple as it can get if you're going to involve an absolute value in a function. Then we could do things like put negatives in there and add numbers and subtract numbers and multiply by numbers, that kind of thing, and we start to uh, get transformations and translations of the original graph. Okay. I'm just move this guy over here. So I want you to do the same thing. I want you to, uh, we're just gonna deal with the input and output and see what comes out of the function. Uh, we're just gonna do y equals negative absolute value of x a negative in front of the absolute value. So we just graph that function, see how it looks, see how it compares to the first one. some new graphs. Does this graph look similar to the graph of y equals absolute value of x? But it looks, how does it look different? It's mirroring the absolute value of x right, over the, over the x-axis. It looks just like this. It would just be a flip, like a vertical flip. Flips it right down over. But the, the negative absolute value would always be negative. Yes. Which is what this is. This is always negative. negative, negative. The output, the, the vertical. But then how are you getting positive x's? Oh, this isn't absolute value of x. Or, or this isn't negative absolute value of x. This is absolute value of x. Right, this is uh, absolute value of x. Right? For the negative absolute value of x, we could write that here. Do it in green since it's also <coughs> green. Negative 5 goes into the absolute value of x. Right? What's the absolute value of negative 5? 5 and negative, so you get negative 5. And 3 goes in, absolute value of 3 is 3, make it negative, negative 3. So the same outputs, they're just the exact opposite of 0. There's no opposite of 0. So that's the, that's the kind of observation that I would like you to make, the kind of connection that I'd like your brain to make. 
it. Look at what we did. We took the, the absolute value function, and then we took what that function does, right? We kind of took that function, and then we took all the outputs of the function. As soon as all those things started coming out of the absolute value of x factory, okay? This is like a factory, and stuff's going in. And as soon as it comes out of the absolute value of x factory, we slap a negative on it, right? That's what this does. Does that make sense, the analogy? This comes out, we slap a negative on it. So all the outputs of absolute value of x just get made negative. If we look at the graph, the same thing is going to happen. The output, this, is made negative. It's just going to be reflected over the x-axis. This output is made negative. It goes down there. So the one you just graphed. Mm -hmm. Which green one? Yeah, the green one. Which one is that? That's the negative green one. But you have positive x values there. X values, yes. Y but you values. Got all, all the y values are the ones that are always going to be well, first positive, because of the absolute value, and then always negative, because of this negative sign. Because but that's the absolute x. value is always going to be positive. No. What, right. what we get after we put in x will be y. Right? Once x goes through the motions and is changed by whatever the function is doing, the result is y. Yeah, so they're both always negative. Could I, could I try to explain? No. x can be I got any an idea. Am I? Yeah, but then it becomes negative. Then y is negative. Go ahead. I think I might have an idea that'll get the point across. Could I borrow that pen? Yeah. So uh, it has the uh, equation, Gordon. So inside the absolute value, there is x. Would it help if you looked at the x's if it was in parentheses? No. It's like x could be 4, could be 5, could be 6. Yeah, If no matter what number it is, it's, its absolute value is positive, right? Yeah, and, and then you, you have slap, a negative sign on the outside. Negative on it. Which means he's not doing the negative. Uh, exactly. uh, x exactly. is still x. It has then nothing to do with it. It just once it the negative can't listen to four people is part of the output. That's fair. You can't listen to four people okay. at once. Cool. I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever number you put in is x, and you, so you can put in a negative or a positive. It's not always going to be negative. Yeah. If I put in. negative seven into the absolute value, it will come out as seven. But then there's a negative on the outside of the absolute value, yeah. which means so it's still negative will seven. Be negative but, yeah, but if you put in positive, positive, positive 7, then it's positive 7, you slap a negative on there, and it's still negative 7. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's y but then y when so he graphed it, he went into the positives. How do you get a positive number when it has to be negative? That's how you graph so, it. You go Gordon, x, and then you go to y. The, there's not many steps to go through. The steps that you go through to get x turned into y is not very many, so I can see where there's like this confusion. But x is only the thing that goes in. Once it starts to get absolute valued and negative, it's not going to be x anymore. It's going to be the output. It's going to be y. The thing going into it is x. So x goes in there. That's all x is. Once something changes, we're starting to look at what the output is, what y is. Okay, so what goes in is x. And I can put anything into the absolute value I want, negative, positive. Whatever. That's why I can put positive values. That's why you can have positive x values. But then you add a negative, so it can't. Right, and then it ceases to be x anymore. The x. Once the negative hits it, it's a y. But you still have to graph it, or you would just end up with points going up and down on the y axis. Right. So, positive x, always negative y. The output, the result, is always negative. The input can be positive, and then the result, the output, is negative. But they both always have to be negative because y will be equal to a negative number, but the negative number is x. No, the, the number that is x is the number that you put in. Yeah. Right. Can you put a positive number into the absolute value? Yes. So x can be positive. It doesn't have to be negative. It's not actually. But it's still two sides of the equation. You're still graphing two sides of the equation. Right. So stop arguing and go with it. <laughs> no, I like that Gordon's asking this question. I am not an this automaton that is some slave to a consumer treadmill that the teacher throws at my face. I think. I <laughs> you're, you're wrong, but it's okay. Be a poet. <laughs> I like that you're bringing up these issues, okay? Because it highlights. No issue. Yes, it is. If there's any confusion that, an imp that a person has, it's something we should address. Um, we might not be able to take as much time as I'd like to because we are we're constrained, but we can we can talk about this. Um, the thing that goes in is x. This is the the x-axis, the input axis. Okay. 
So all the graph is is just a visual representation of what we get out given the thing that we put in. Okay, so if I put in a three right, into this negative absolute value equation, if I put in a three, that's positive. And that doesn't change. X doesn't change. What I put in is always what I put in. Yeah. Okay? So when I do the math to it, and I, I do what the, all the operations, that doesn't change what I put in. That's changing what's about to come out. Okay? You can look at it this way. 3 goes into this function. And what comes out is what? The new number. The new it's number, the, the output. output. Negative 3. Well, I still put 3 in there. It was still okay that I put a positive number in there. What comes out is not x. What comes out is y. Yeah. Okay? So it doesn't always have to be negative. It doesn't always have to be positive. Some functions will be like this. This function can take any number yeah. and turn it into the absolute value and give a negative to it. Yeah, gotcha. yeah I wasn't challenging that. So what are, you, what are you confused about? You're saying something's positive and it can't be positive. No, I, I was just saying that we're only graphing one part of one side of the equal sign. No, we're, we're graphing both. One, in, if you're thinking of one side as x and the other side as y, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying one, we have to graph both sides. Okay, then maybe that's the confusion, because we're not graphing two sides of an equation, we're graphing two variables, one that went in and one that came out. Okay. Okay, so this side is not x. This side is actually y, and you know that by this equation, this yeah. equal sign, it is y. But the other side is also x. No, this side is not x. This side is also y. Stop. If it weren't, then this equation would be false. y has to be equal to y. This is y. The whole thing, after you put an x and do all the math, that is y. Okay. So both sides are y. Both sides are y. But the way we get y is to plug things in for x and then do all the math. Right. So we're not graphing two sides of an equation, which, I mean, it's a great conversation. It's better than... Just accepting everything because I told you. I appreciate it. Um, so the thing that you put in is x. The thing that results is y. This side is y, this side is y. But within the y is, is these places where you put x to find y. OK? Oh. So hopefully that helped. Yeah. OK, good. Not people yelling at my face. <laughs> <laughs> I was yelling at your face. <laughs> I was not yelling at your face. You scared me. What? Good. OK. I can yell. Let's, uh, let's do some other things. Let's, let's change this function in some other ways and see how it, uh, it affects the shape, okay? And we'll get another page because uh, we're running out of room here. So uh, we'll just put y equals absolute value of x. Just like that. Looks something like this. Okay. We did negative. That flipped it over the x-axis. Let's see what this might do. Um, probably an easier one to do. So, so think of this as you got one function that's the absolute value of x, right? And we know what the absolute value of x puts out, right? It just takes a number and makes it always it's the absolute, the, the output is positive, right? It's a positive version of whatever you got. You put in x and you get out y. Well, this guy right here is going to take all those outputs, right? And they're just going to come in here. And what's this going to do? Add two. Add two. So it's going to add two to the thing. So all these outputs are going to spill out into this plus two and get plus two. Okay. So you can imagine what the outputs would. I want you to like mentally think, like, okay, so if I were to put x, an absolute value of h, an x, and an absolute value of x plus two, you know, uh, you get one, you get one, what, what would that transition look like? And then what effect do I think that would have on the graph if I go to graph all these things? So that's what I want you to do in your notes to see uh, how that's going to change things. How's it going to change the graph specifically? But getting that connection between the output being changed and the graph being changed, and what part of the graph is the output, that's the important part. And if you get it, you make me smile so much.
actual journal that I'll write these in. So let, let's put in some inputs and see what our outputs look like at the very end. Absolute value of x plus 2. Put in 2. Absolute value of 2 is 2. Absolute value of 2 is 2. Plus 2 is 4. Negative 3. Absolute value of negative 3 is 3. When we add 2 to that, we get 5. We see how this column is just this column plus 2. Um, uh, 0. We get 0 for the absolute value. We add 2. We get 2. Right? So. All this function is, is just this number, you know, this function plus two, the output is two more than the output of the original function. Did you have something to say? Um, is it pretty much the same, just the, we start at two? Yeah, it's like the, yeah, we could move this point up two, up one, two, and think about it, that's the point zero, zero, right? Zero, zero, and you add two, so it goes up to two. I should really do this in a different color. So yeah, the, the output of this function, we can look at it in a column and see the output of the absolute value of x and add 2 to it. Or we can see the output in a graph. The ap output at this point is 0. We add 2 to that, we get 2. We can go to this output. This output looks like maybe it's 1. We can add 2 to 1 and go up 2. Right? So that's up at 3. All of these points on this graph right here are going to increase by 2. So they're all just going to move up 2 on the graph. That's what it looks like on the graph. This is what it looks like in, uh, in a table of values. This is what it looks like as a function. Okay. Lots of different ways to represent it. I guess I should say as an equation. So all these points move up 2. We have the exact same graph, just raised up 2. What if you did plus 3? What would, what would that look like compared to this blue graph? Another point compared to this, this one right here, and move it up to the 3. If we did minus 5, we go down 5, right? We would take, we would take every, uh, every output and subtract 5. Go down 5, go down 5, go down 5, go down 5, down 5 right? All the outputs. Are you confused by something I said in that? Okay. So whatever this number is, whether we, where we're adding or subtracting, what kind of an effect does it have on the graph? It, will, it moves all the points. It moves all the points, all the outputs, yeah. up, or down, up and down, right? Okay. Because what we're doing, we're, we're affecting the output. This thing represents the output of this function. So we take this function, we add 2 to it, all the outputs are going to be 2 more. Up to down five, whatever we add or subtract to that function. So far, we put a negative in front of the absolute value, and what are putting a negative in front of the absolute value do? To the graph. Yeah, it flipped it over the x-axis. Flipped it right over. We made all those outputs negative. When we added two, it didn't make the outputs negative. It it made all the outputs greater by two added two to them, so all the outputs would be two higher, or if it was minus five, five lower. Looking at the absolute value of x again. Looks like this. Okay. Let's think about y equals five times the absolute value of x. You start to, as you start to understand this input output idea more as it relates to the graph, make a prediction of what this graph would look like compared to, this, to the absolute value of x graph, that green graph.
<coughs> Did you guys make predictions about what you thought the graph would look like in your minds? Yeah. Anybody did? You did? Were you right? Yeah. Not sure right. Okay. Um, so let's see, zero goes in the absolute value, we get zero. We multiply by five, we get zero, no change there. Negative one goes to the absolute value, we get one. We multiply by five, we get five. One goes in, we get one, we multiply by five, we get five. Put in negative two, you get two, you multiply by five, you get ten. Put in two, you get two, you multiply by five, you get ten. So when you look at the outputs of the original function, the parent function, uh, absolute value of x, and the values of five times the absolute value of x, how do they compare? Is this saying that it's not if it's negative or positive? This is saying or it's negative is positive. Negative or positive, similar to the absolute value function, right? Absolute value is the same whether it's positive or negative. And how do the out outputs compare between absolute value of x and 5 times the absolute value of x? It's so obvious that you're not sure that what you're thinking is actually the answer to my question. It makes it 5 times steeper. Yeah, that's it. It's 5 times higher, right? And therefore that line will be 5 times steeper. Is that, right? If we, if we uh, multiply the rise part by five, it's gonna be five times deeper. So where absolute value of x goes to one one, five times the absolute value of x goes to one five. And it goes to two, 10, uh, there. It's much steeper. It's five times steeper. It's five times, every, every output is five times as big as the output of, this, of the uh, absolute value of x. So if we put a number here that's uh, bigger than 1, then what will it do to the graph? If we put a 2 in there, or a 3, a 4, a 5, what will it do to the graph? In general. Two times steeper, three times steeper, four times, whatever times steeper, right? Yeah. Whatever the number is. Even three halves, right? Three halves is more than one, it's one and a half. Mm -hmm. If you had one and a half of something, you'd have more, of the, more than the original. <coughs> if you multiply this by not five, but three halves, it still would be a little bit higher than the output of the absolute value of x. So if we have a number that's bigger than one, we'll get a steeper graph. So a number that's bigger than one would be a steeper graph. What if we did something like one half, or one third, or two fifths, or something like that? Yeah, we get uh, like an output of one, and then if we did two fifths of the absolute value of x, we get less steep. Yeah, still get zero there. Two fifths, two fifths again, two. That's gonna be four fifths. It's gonna be four fifths. Okay. It's not gonna be as steep as the original function. This one's going to go to 1 comma 2 fifths, which is about right there, and uh, 2 comma 4 fifths, which is moving quite 1, and that's like that. Okay. Not nice. Y equals, I'm taking the absolute value of x, and what things have we done to the absolute value of x function to change it? We've added to it, okay? So we get to add some, let's call it k. Okay, what did adding k do to the graph? Moved it up. Moved it up, moved it down, if it's negative, right? So, moves vertically. It doesn't change the steepness, right? It doesn't, like, change its shape at all, but it moves it up and down. Okay. We put a negative in front, what does a negative do? Mirrors it over the x-axis. Mirrors it over the x-axis. Mirror over x axis. Okay, we can put a number, a, num, uh, a letter there to represent the number, we can call it A, right? And what did uh, A do to the graph? Did multiplying it by a number do it? It affects the steepness, right? So uh, two things could happen if we like to split up in two things. Like uh, bigger than one, 
bigger than one, so like two or three or three halves or something like that, made it more steep. And if it's less than one, less steep. We've done quite a few things to this function. Is there anything else we can think of that we can do to this function? Okay, divide it. We can take the absolute value and divide it. Couldn't we think of that as though, like, if we're gonna divide it by two, could we multiply it by one half? Right? So that's it, that's in play. Anything else? How about if we if we come inside the absolute value and we add something to that? X plus something, or x minus something. Okay. Now I want you to think about this. What when we were on the outside of the absolute value, we added something. What did that do? We've already written it down. It moves it vertically. It moves it vertically. So what do you think maybe adding something to the x would do? Keep in mind, when x has gone through its, its transformation uh, by taking the absolute value, multiplying by a, multiplying by negative, there's a negative there. It's, it's now the output, it's y. But what if we add something to it before we take the absolute value, before we do the thing that is the function, the absolute value? Three. Think it What's that? Raise. Raise it horizontally? Well, raise is a vertical it. term, right? Or just like move it? Yeah. Move it in a horizontal direction? Let's see. y equals absolute value of x, okay, right? Looks like this. Please come back to this. Uh, here we'll, we'll pick one out of the book. Uh, here it is, number four. They got it all. Y equals the absolute value of x. Keep in mind, what I'm about to do is is before we take the absolute value. All the stuff we've been doing. It's been on outside the absolute value. Add something after we take the absolute value. Multiply it by something after we take the absolute value. But now we're adding something before we take the absolute value. Think of, make just a quick guess in your mind what you think this might do to the graph. Then actually find some inputs and outputs and see what the graph looks like. Okay. Go ahead. Don't be scared. Also, don't think that you know. Investigate. Prove your, your guess.
this analogy between uh, functions and like a factory. Right? Okay. So you can take things in and push things out. That's what factories do. So by adding to the outside, we're taking the absolute value, the output. Right? We're taking the output, we're applying the absolute value, and then it's coming out, it's being, it's having to added to that, right? So we're affecting the output when we add something on the outside of the function. But here we come inside, over here, and now we're affecting the thing that we're taking the absolute value of, absolute value of. Before we ever take the absolute value, we're changing what that thing is. Right? So we put in zero into x plus two, but then we don't take the absolute value of zero, do we? We take the absolute value of two. two. So it's not changing the input. It, it's not changing the input. But it is take, changing the thing that you take the absolute value of. The input is still zero. Zero goes in here. But then it gets two added to it before it gets a chance to be taken the absolute value of, and now the absolute value is two. And then when we put in one, we're not, we don't take the absolute value of one. We take the absolute value of three. When we do negative one, we don't take the absolute value of negative one. We have to take the absolute value of one. And the absolute value of one is one. Uh, and for negative two, negative two plus two is zero. That's, that's kind of funny. So let's go look and see what this function looks like if we graph it. We go to zero comma two. Let's say that's two. One comma three. Uh, negative one comma one. Oh, we didn't do two. That's the problem. You put in two, you add two, you get four absolute value of four. So four. Okay. <coughs> so we go to two, comma four, and negative two, comma zero. Do you think now that it's down the x-axis, do you think it'll come back up if we keep moving that way? The absolute value, the, the, the output of this function is still the absolute value of some number, so probably. Let's try negative three. Okay. This will give you three. This will give you negative three plus two is negative one. Absolute value of negative one is one. So at negative three, we go up to one. So that's what's happening. So what effect did that have on the graph? They moved it that way too. Did you think that's what would happen? What did you think would happen? I wasn't sure. Are you I weren't sure? I didn't think it would move it that way. Did you think it would be horizontal? Did you think maybe it would be to the right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? Because if we go back here and we add two on the outside of the function, it moved up two. That's a positive move. Positive is up, right? But over here, we add two, and that gives us a left move. Um, but if you think about it, like to recreate this shape, we got to figure out like where, what kind of inputs do we have to put in here? Well, we're adding two to whatever we put in. Right? So a nice uh, reference point is this guy right here, right? And right now it's at the origin, but here it's over here at negative two zero. This is a thing we call the vertex. The vertex is some kind of a, like an absolute, is that the very top or the very bottom? That's what we call a vertex most often. Um, so move the vertex and every other point to the left too. Um, but that makes sense because if we're gonna add two and we wanna figure out what number would have to go in here in order to get zero, right, an input of zero so that we get an output of zero. What number do you have to put in so that when you add two, you get zero? Negative two. Negative two. So all the numbers to, to recreate this shape, you gotta go to the left two to kind of recreate this graph. Right? So you go to negative two, so when you add two, it's zero, and now you have your old, 
year old output of zero for the vertex. Well, let's just finish out this guy right here. I'm going to grab this much. Bring it over. Right. And since it turns out that doing stuff on the inside has like the opposite effect that you would think, say minus h instead of plus h. And then whatever h is, that's how much it moves it horizontally. We'll just put horizontal to horizontal. So now, if h, if h is negative, then we're subtracting a negative number, so we're actually adding. So if h is negative, actually, we'll move to the left. And if h is positive, we'll move to the right. Because what we're doing is subtracting h. So at h, whatever h is, when you make this be a negative, and whatever k is, that's where you'll find the vertex of your absolute value function. Because if we combine these things, like say this one, x plus 2. If after uh, we do x plus 2 and take the square root, we then add 3. Well, what, did that, what effect does that have, adding something after the absolute value? What effect does that have on the graph? It moves vertically, <coughs> moves up 3. So if it moves to the left 2 and it moves up 3, that will move the vertex to the left 2 and up 3. <coughs> um, and if you want, as you're graphing these, one more helpful little hint. Maybe this. Yeah, so we'll flap over that here. This guy A right here, it affects the steepness, right? The slope. Doesn't those, these things have slope, don't they? But it doesn't exactly work if we, right? Okay, so this has some slope like this, but the slope doesn't continue this way. It like, has the opposite slope going this way. Not the opposite reciprocal slope, but the opposite slope. Um, so if we come over here, we can say that A, whatever A is, including the, the negative, if there's a negative, right, this part will be, I guess you could put a, a little circle around the whole thing. This little thing will be the slope of the right half. The right half of that V shape will be the, will be determined by whatever number is multiplied by the absolute value. So now we're going to, we're, that was 2.7, now we're going to do, there's this thing between 2.7 and 2.8 called the extension, it's about piecewise defined functions. So we're going to get our piecewise defined functions. Are there any questions from this about absolute value, graphing absolute value, the changes that adding stuff, multiplying, all that kind of stuff does to it? Two point seven extension piecewise defined How do you think piecewise defined functions are defined? It's all in the name. Yeah? Piece by piece. It's by piece, yeah. It's made up of several different pieces. Okay? So I'm gonna show you. Uh, in a picture, because I think a picture is easier to look at than what the equation winds up looking like. Okay. Right. So here we go. Now remember, we can represent a function any old way we want to, lots of different ways. We can represent it as a graph, as an equation, as a table of values, as a mapping diagram, as anything that we can think of that shows input versus output. So we'll start with the graph. The, the, the equation and the graph are the most common. Okay, so there's this thing, there's this piece, piecewiseness about it. It's in pieces. Okay, so the way we cut it into pieces 
is, is, is by the input, right? For some inputs, we'll uh, define it one way, and it, but with some other inputs, we'll use another definition. So let's say that right here, this is one. This is x equals one. Okay. Well, what kind of x values do we find over here? Well, they are positive, but they're, they're not like all the positive numbers. There's a positive number here that we're not talking about. Uh, oh, they're, inputs. <coughs> they're inputs, they are positive, but th we have to be more specific than just positive. Okay, so our inputs, right, our x's, are bigger than 1. x is greater than 1 on that side of, of that division, right, where we're cutting into, we're cutting into two pieces uh, by this dotted line here. This piece is the piece where x is greater than 1. And this piece is what? x is less than 1. Okay, and this is where x is equal to 1. So this is how this is the basis of a piecewise defined function. When x is this, uh, do this. When x is something else, do this other thing. When x is this other thing, do this other thing. Okay, we can cut it into two, three, four, a hundred pieces, whatever we want. For now, we'll just start with two pieces. So now I have to just tell you when x is less than one, what I want you to do, like how I want you to define this function. Okay, so that's where this comes in. So when x is less than one. I want to tell you what to do. Let's uh, change that color. When x is less than one, I want to tell you how to define the function. It's going to be defined this way. 2x plus one. Let's just say that. Okay. 2x plus one. So over here, where x is less than one, use that function. Right. Not over here. When you get over here, stop using this function. But use this function over here. All right, so what's that going to look like? How am I going to going to graph that on this side of the on this side of the graph? Should be able to graph that. Somebody tell me how to begin. <coughs> to one, y-intercept of one, right? And then up two over one. Okay, so I can go up two, and I'm going to go up two, and go over one, and put a point right there. And if I draw my line like this, there we go. It's, I'm just using that line, but only when x is less than one. Uh, when x is greater than one, x is greater than one. I want you to use a different function, so I'll use the function. Um, Let's just call it uh, x plus 2. Well, now we're, we just want to get an idea of what this function looks like altogether. Um, so how would I graph this function? Start positive 2. Start positive 2. It's just a line, guys. Yeah, just go up to 2. Now. Should I draw a line over here? Should I draw the screen line over here? No. Because no, yeah, we're at less than one. We're less than one to use this function, but we can use it as a as a guide to get us the stuff over here, right? So what's next? Up one over one. Just go the slope, right? Okay. There, so there's another point. It happens to land right there. Up one over one, right? So it's not as steep as that blue one. There we go. That's a piecewise function, piecewise defined function. We just cut the input into pieces, two pieces, three pieces, five pieces, it doesn't matter. And then in each of those uh, sections, we define the function with some, usually some kind of an equation. So, um, now, this. The domain of this function isn't quite what we want it to be. Right now, it's only defined for x is less than 1 and x is greater than 1. Right? That's a lot of numbers, but we are missing a number. What number are we missing? 
Zero. Okay. Zero is less than one. One. One itself, right? So I could say uh, do that, okay, and that fixes it. I could put the equals under there, but not both, obviously. I could even do something really weird looking and uh, say just use five when x is equal to one. Be like three pieces, less than one, more than one, and right at one. Right, so uh, go to one and go up to what's this? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we use this blue function all the way from negative infinity up until one, but then we stop using it. We jump up to five because when x is one, we use y is five, and when x is greater than one, then this line is the, or this function is the one that takes over. And piecewise defined functions. So if we put all of these together, we group them with this curly bracket, that's f of x, or that's y, or whatever. So my, my hope is that by explaining it that way and, and breaking it into you know, revealing each piece individually, this thing won't look so strange. Okay. These parts right here, these are defining what pieces, where the pieces are delineated. Where does one piece stop and the other piece start? Okay? These are the pieces. Okay. These are the definitions. That's how we define the function. When we say the function, what we really mean is what comes out of the function. Pretty much anything can go into a function. That's boring. The thing that makes a function different is what comes out of it. Okay. So how we define the function, how we define the y value is decided by these guys. Well, it's decided by these, and then that's how we know what the definition is. The output is decided by these guys. So that's where your pieces are. That's how they uh, are cut up. That's how each piece is defined. Right. So we'll I'm going to have you uh, try one yourself. So this is just after 2.7, after the exercise of 2.7 on page 130, page 130, or page 131. Um, let's do number six. So graph number six in your notes.
how can we start to, to help us visualize how this is broken up? Can we draw something on the graph that'll help us see where to use one function and where to start using the other function? It's a helpful little thing to, that doesn't, that's not part of the graph, right? This dotted line is like imaginary. It's not actually part of the input and the output, but it does give us a visual of where one function will stop and the other will start. So, um, so where are we here? How do we define this region of the graph? Less than two. Less than what? Less than two. Is that what you said? Less than two. Okay. We're less than two. X is less than two. So if X is less than two, then what function do we use? The one that's in green, the one that's right next to X is less than two. So negative one half X minus one is just a line, the slope, and a Y intercept. Negative one for the Y intercept. Up. One and to the left, two. Well, that part of it can come down here, and we'll stop right there. Okay. Now, when we get to two, do we use that function? Do we use the green function? No. So when we get to two, we don't use this. So it's the same as like a number line, where we don't include two. Where but, but until we draw that other one, we'll have an open circle here. This lets us know that we, we don't get all the way to 2, or we're just close to 2. And this other one might meet up, and it might not meet up. It doesn't have to. That's not the way uh, piecewise, fun piecewise functions have to work. We'll, st we'll graph this one now. We'll start at uh, negative 7. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And uh, we'll, we'll have it help us uh, graph this out. So we'll go. Um, up three, one, two, three, and over one. Uh, and then up, let's see, did I do this right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up three, and over one, two, three, and over one. Okay? And we'll hold up another here, one, two, two, three, and over one. Okay, and now we have two points to graph our line. Put an arrow on the left side. Here we do include uh, two in the in this function, so we'll put a closed circle because we do go all the way to two, and x can be equal to two. So if you know how to graph lines, which you should know how to do, um, and most of these are going to be defined by lines. We should be able to cut the, the graph into pieces, right, defined by some x values. We could do several pieces. We could do x between negative 5 and positive 2 and have that piece defined by another function. We do it however we want. But we divide it up into pieces, and then in each piece we just graph the function that is the one that belongs to that region. All right. Well, that's it. You guys have any questions about that? Or other things? Gordon? Questions? Gordon has good questions.